Imagine you're enjoying a girl's night out in your hometown with your best friends. Drinking, dancing, hanging out, cutting loose with not a care in the world. And you deserve it. You've been working hard all week. But what no one deserves is a normal night out that ends with their very last breath. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. This case, like all of the rest, has affected me, but this one way more than others. And they do say that you're connected to everyone and there's the six degrees of separation between all of us. And I am personally connected to an aspect of this case. I didn't know it until I was done conducting all of my research, but I will tell you about it. But before I do, I want to thank our sponsor for today, it's one of my favorites, and that is Dipsy. I've worked with them a number of times already, so I want to thank them so very much for being a consistent and loyal sponsor for my channel and making these videos possible. I've introduced you to this app before, and they're supporting my channel once again, which makes me so happy, plus I really do love this app. This sponsor has a product that's a little bit different from the others that I've shared with you, but I do like bringing you new things all the time. Some of you have already heard about it, but if you haven't, listen to this because you might be intrigued. I know I found this to be very interesting and very helpful. I try every single brand's products before I ever share them with you, and I've now been using the Dipsy app, I wanna say for maybe three months, and I thought you might enjoy it as well. I'm guessing you like stories because you are here to listen to one today, and Dipsy is a storytelling app with a little something extra. They're sexy audio stories, and they also have new written stories as well. I feel like no matter who you are or what turns you on, Dipsy includes stories from narrators that have very soothing voices that can calm you, get you to relax, put you to sleep, and more. I liken the stories to romance novels, and I know at least some of you like reading or hearing about those type of stories. And not only that, there's a wellness section of this app and it has guides. I wish I knew about them a long time ago. I say it every time because I know that talking about sex can be a little taboo. I feel awkward every time I talk about it, but then I always think to myself, why? Most of us, if not all of us, are doing it. I'm 40 and I was sitting here scared to even use the app at first, but I'm so glad I found it. And I'm so glad I gave it a chance because I found it to be extremely informative and a lot of fun. You can use it to explore new things or spice things up. If you're in a new relationship or you've been in a long-term relationship, you might want to try something new. And I love learning. These tips are definitely ones that you can use, not just learn about, but actually put them into practice. And I'd say no matter what your level of experience is, give it a go. If you're into romance and you like stories to ease your mind and provide an escape from stress, this app is for you. You can just close your eyes and let yourself get lost in a world where only good things happen and pleasure is your only priority. You can explore your fantasies in a safe and shame-free way. There are hundreds of stories to choose from. Plus, they release new content every single week, so there's always more to indulge in. The wellness section, like I mentioned, it'll help you wind down and explore while the sleep sessions help you to drift off to sleep. Try something new, especially while Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Kimberlea. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash Kimberlea. I'm going to leave it up on the screen like usual, and there will also be a link in my description box below. I downloaded the app and purchased the year membership myself because I wanted to be brave and go beyond my comfort zone. And I'm really glad I did. So I want to thank Dipsy once again for supporting this channel and sponsoring yet another video. Now let's get into the case for today. As I explained in the beginning, this case has really affected me. All of the cases I talk about do, but this one has stuck with me. Many of us can relate to the victims that we hear about on this channel. Many of the suggestions come from you or there are videos and stories that speak to me in one way or another, and this one is one of those videos. Today's case is about a beautiful woman 
named Lindsay Marie Nichols. Lindsay reminds me of me in a lot of ways. I was a single mom when I came here to Los Angeles, and I said there's a connection between Lindsay and I, and it's not huge, it's not some mind-blowing connection, but it's what brought me to LA. It was a production company called Renegade 83. I worked for them right after I graduated law school and I was doing contracts for reality TV shows. That is how I met my daughter's father, Jason, on set of a reality TV show. Renegade 83 produces shows for Oxygen, and they produced one of the shows that featured Lindsay's case. I got chills when I saw that Renegade 83 logo. Just to know that some of my previous coworkers may have sat in the same room as some of Lindsay's loved ones, and that I would not be here doing what I do now if I never made the choice to work with that company. So it just, it just made me pause and to think of these subtle but very meaningful connections. But I wanna get back to the real meaningful part of you being here, and that's to get to know Lindsay Nichols. The very first thing I do when I research a case is I scour the internet and beyond for any information that I can find about what they were like Interviews with their parents, their family members, their friends, recounting memories together, newspapers, reporting on events surrounding their death, anything. I will admit that this time, there wasn't as much information about Lindsay's past as there was about what her life was like right before it was taken from her. I learned a lot about Lindsay from Lindsay herself, from her social media presence on Facebook. Although it wasn't that extensive, I was able to piece together information about Lindsay's personality, what she enjoyed, what kind of person she was, and what she was doing in 2015 before that fateful night right before Father's Day in New Orleans. Lindsay Marie Nichols was born in Day Almonds, Louisiana, April 2nd, 1984, to her mother, Jolene Richard. From everything I could gather online, Jolene was a single mom. If not from the start, for most of the time raising Lindsay. Jolene did end up getting married to a man named Audie Dufresne, and Lindsay had a sister, Kayla, from that marriage. Jolene always wanted a daughter, and her wish came true when Lindsay came into this world. She was Jolene's everything. Lindsay was a beautiful little girl, and she grew up to be a very gorgeous woman. She was born and raised in Des Almonds, Louisiana. It's in the southeastern part of Louisiana. It's a very small town, that's for sure, with only about 2,000 people living there up to the present day. This area is surrounded by bayous, which are slow moving creeks or swampy sections of river or lake where the water is still. And sometimes the bayou is seen as eerie or dangerous. There could be unknown creatures lurking under those still surfaces. It's the home to snakes and alligators just waiting to pounce. But this is also Lindsay's home. It's the catfish capital of the universe. Popular things to do there are take airboat rides, crawfish boils, drinking out in the water on boats, and other outdoor activities like hiking, biking, fishing, and that sort of thing. In this area of Louisiana, the locals identify as Cajun. Since there's not too much to do in this tiny town, you become good friends with the people you live near. Growing up, Lindsay had a very close-knit group of girlfriends, with one of her best friends being Jessica Barrios, who grew up with Lindsay. As Lindsay got older, she also found herself in a position like her mother, a single mom to the sweetest, most precious little son named Peter Paul Rose. He looks almost identical to Lindsay. Those big blue eyes, they're out of this world beautiful. Just like Lindsay was Jolene's world, Peter was Lindsay's world. She wanted to do the best she could as far as her career and a stable life was concerned to provide Peter the best life possible. Lindsay's childhood friend Jessica had a daughter close to Peter's age, so the two of them spent time together with their kids who also became very close. But the girls also liked to have some fun, and it wasn't hard to find it either. New Orleans is only 45 minutes northeast of Des Almonds, but being there, you could feel like you're transported to another world. New Orleans, Louisiana is a one-of-a-kind destination. I'm sure that you have at least heard of Mardi Gras. And if so, you probably think it's just lots of drinking, partying, necklace wearing people with outrageous outfits walking down the streets of Louisiana. But the tradition is actually religious in nature. It's from the French Catholic celebrations of the carnival feasts and an expedition for the French to take claim over the Louisiana territory. 
but it evolved over the years. And of course, it's now known as Fat Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday. But sometimes it's celebrated way longer. It can go from a one to three month period. And that's when the streets come alive with art and music and costumes. There are different parts of New Orleans though. And Mardi Gras is traditionally celebrated in the French Quarter. But about 20 minutes away, you'll find New Orleans East. And those two areas are like night and day. After Hurricane Katrina in 2005, this area, like many others, was practically destroyed. Just look at Six Flags Amusement Park. They had to permanently close their doors after the entire park flooded. It was underwater. By 2015, almost a decade later, the Little Woods neighborhood in eastern New Orleans was ranked first among the most dangerous neighborhoods. Parts of eastern New Orleans are really rough, but those who grew up there, they don't know any difference. So Lindsay wasn't afraid. She was popular among the locals. She considered people here her people. This is where she found herself on the night of June 20th, 2015. But we have to backtrack for you to understand what brought Lindsay out that night. I said Lindsay was popular. Well, because of how pretty she was, she did get into modeling. She did a lot of it. And you can tell she really enjoyed getting dolled up, having her pictures taken, her hair, the makeup, everything. And it was obvious that men liked looking at her too. Generally speaking, Lindsay was sexy. So those were the types of pictures that were taken of her, either in lingerie or a sexy dress. I mean, she looked good in anything, even when the pictures weren't professional. And you can tell from the comments, Lindsay knew that she caught the attention of men with no problems. Sometimes this means unwanted attention too, but Lindsay was sweet. She was kind-hearted and she made friends easily. She wasn't the type to give anyone any issues. And that's why she was popular. She made people feel important and she was fun. Lindsay liked to go out. She liked to have drinks. She loved Outback Steakhouse, to dance, spend time with friends. And of course, in order to play hard, you usually have to work hard. By the summer of 2014, Lindsay was looking for a job. She wanted something serious, and she ended up finding one. However, it took her out of Louisiana and into Texas. By October 2014, Lindsay was saying goodbye to her Louisiana friends on Facebook and moving. Lindsay worked as a timekeeper at Texas construction sites. She would be on the move to different work sites all day, every day, and she was a hard worker, very serious about her position. But anytime she had off from work, she wanted to go back home and be with her core group of friends. That was Jessica Ann, Lauren, and Jessica Barrios. Of course, since Lindsay was outgoing and funny and fun to be around, she had lots of friends and even more acquaintances, but her close girlfriends are the ones that she couldn't wait to get back to every time she left. She would go back and forth every few months until she moved back to Louisiana. And this is what I was gathering according to Lindsay's Facebook because she posted that she actually bought a place and was coming home to pack and move. That was on May 24th, 2015. That was an exciting time. Summer was coming up. There was a lot to do in New Orleans over the summer. By June, Lindsay was back in Louisiana and aching to meet up with her girls for a girls' night out. It was Saturday, June 20th, 2015. Lindsay was back in town and she was ready to party. By 9.30 p.m., Lindsay was calling her friends. She called Jessica Ann first. Jessica was in the middle of getting her hair done, but she could tell that Lindsay was excited to get out and have some fun that night. Lindsay's friends knew that she was back in town and she just wanted to cut loose because she worked hard, like I said. Lindsay worked seven days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day. The job she did meant that she had to travel to different locations doing timekeeping in this construction industry and it can be a pretty fast-paced career. Since her friends knew this, they didn't want to let her down. So Jessica was ready to celebrate that Lindsay was back in town. She hadn't seen her in quite some time so they decided to go get some drinks and hang out for a little while. They went to a sports bar called Gabby's. They also invited Lauren but she does have kids and she couldn't get a babysitter that night. She decided to stay home and she said they could do something another night. Gabby's is in the New Orleans East area. There's food, they have pool tables, drinks, music, plus the girls knew just about everyone in that area. So once they got there, they were bumping into people left and right, they were saying hello, they were hanging out, having drinks and having fun. Now usually when the girls go out, Jessica is the one that goes home first. 
She's kind of looked at as the mom of the group. She's down to earth and grounded and cautious. She's the I gotta get home at a certain time type of girl. So as it was getting a little later in the night, past midnight, Jessica did let Lindsay know that she was planning on going home. But before they said goodnight, they went to another bar called Spice Bar and Grill. This was about one o'clock in the morning. They were going there to meet up with another friend, Melanie. And Melanie was going to continue hanging out with Lindsay when Jessica proceeded to go home. Because at this point in the night, Jessica was uncomfortable. The night had been wearing on her and she just had enough. She wanted to leave. It wasn't as though Jessica didn't like spice or she didn't like the atmosphere. She just felt weird for whatever reason. She kept telling Lindsay she thinks they should just leave and call it a night. But since Lindsay hadn't been out in a while, she wanted to continue partying. Just before Jessica left, this guy Bam shows up. This is someone that the girls are familiar with. They've hung out in the past. Not really a good friend, but not so much an acquaintance either. It's someone that Lindsay had known for a couple years. At this point, it's about 1.30 in the morning. Jessica's leaving, Melanie, Bam, and Lindsay decide that they wanna continue the party. It is Father's Day just after midnight, and Lindsay offers to buy Bam a drink and take the group to a strip club. They leave, they part ways with Jessica, and the three of them go to a place called Passion Strip Club. A lot of people that are local to this area in New Orleans East go there. This is a rougher side of town. This isn't an upscale establishment whatsoever. It's kind of a hole in the wall, but it is cheap. I went to research it and I found out it's cheap and there's a lot of reasons why. Not to mention the fact that there's a lot of scandalous stuff that has been known to go on there. Many underage girls have come forward complaining about all types of really bad things happening to them, even being pimped out to clients. But apparently... They have really cheap drinks and a really cheap cover charge. So it's like $5 to get in. So the group of friends decided they would just go hang out, have some fun, just for a few more hours. I was really interested in this establishment, and you're going to find out why in just a few moments. But I went on Yelp, and even though they're permanently closed at this point, I went back and read some of the reviews from people who actually hung out at Passions just to get an idea of what it was like. What I read wasn't great. I mean, they only had six reviews, so it's not a great representation of this place, but there were really negative things. People got robbed, pickpocketed, scammed. It wasn't an overall great place to hang out. But one of the reasons people did was because it's open until four o'clock in the morning or later. It seemed like sometimes it was open later than that. I don't think it had rules. Let's just let's just put it that way. A lot of times if you're getting out of a bar or a club that closes at let's say one or two o'clock in the morning and you still wanna have drinks and hang out, you could go somewhere like Passions. So Melanie, Lindsay, and Bam head over there. As soon as they get in, Lindsay starts saying hi to people. She knows a lot of people that are working there and she just knows a lot of people that are hanging out there that are from the area. Lindsay is very friendly and as a matter of fact, when she does drink alcohol, she becomes even more friendly. Some of us can relate. Inhibitions are lowered when you're drinking. Lindsay is also very attractive. She had a number of guys flirting with her, coming up to her, giving her hugs, saying their hellos, buying her drinks and hanging out. A couple guys did end up joining their group and one of them seemed to know Lindsay really well. Because when he came into the club, Lindsay ran over to him and gave him a hug and sort of jumped into his arms and he picked her up. He was really cute, really outgoing, beautiful, big, white smile. And he and Lindsay, they matched. Their energy matched. And they were having a really fun time together. Everything was going just fine. Everyone was having a great time. But finally, you know, it's getting later, or shall I say earlier, because now it's heading into the early morning. At this point, Bam and Lindsay leave together, leaving Melanie behind. The next morning, or later in that morning, it's Father's Day, and Jolene, Lindsay's mom, texts her to remind her to text her husband a happy Father's Day message. She doesn't get an answer back, but that's not unusual. Jolene knows when her daughter goes out, she's probably going to sleep in the next day. However, Lindsay's mom, she sees that she has a missed phone call, and the person left a message on her voicemail. She went ahead and played the message. And what she heard had so many thoughts going through her head. It was kind of unusual considering the phone call was from a man who Jolene had sold 
her home to. This is the home back in Lindsay's hometown, but the message that she heard was even more strange and out of the ordinary. He said that the cops had come to the house looking for the parents of Lindsay Nichols. At that point, Jolene knows that something is wrong and something was very wrong. To understand this message, we have to go back to early that morning around 6 o'clock a.m. New Orleans Police Department, they get a phone call from some security officers. They say that there's an abandoned, possibly stolen vehicle out in New Orleans East on a desolate stretch of road on Michoud Boulevard. This isn't considered an emergency, so no one is sent out right away. But then another phone call comes in. This one's about 8 o'clock in the morning. That second phone call is from someone saying that the same vehicle in that same location was now on fire. It's described as a black vehicle with dark tinted windows. And the caller says he couldn't see if anyone was inside the car and what led to the fire. The fire department is alerted immediately and they go out there to put the fire out. When firefighters arrive, they realize that the car isn't exactly engulfed in flames. There's more smoke emanating from the car than a raging fire. Nevertheless, they need to douse the vehicle and in order to get inside, let the smoke out, they open all of the doors. When they get to the trunk and it's opened, they're shocked by what they find inside. They can tell that there is a human body inside the trunk and they are no longer alive. And that is when my new favorite homicide detective, Detective Barrer, arrives. This man is amazing. He is a phenomenal homicide detective. Robert Barrer gets the phone call. He's sent out there with his team. And when something like this happens, everyone has to stop what they're doing. Firefighters have to stop. Obviously, the fire is still put out. There's nothing happening in regard to the fire being out of control or anything like that. But at this point, it is a homicide investigation. That department needs to come on the scene and take the lead. Now, I want to show you exactly where this location is. Remember I mentioned Six Flags? There was a reason I specifically pointed out the fact that Six Flags Amusement Park had been destroyed in Hurricane Katrina. This vehicle was parked just two minutes from the entrance of Six Flags. This is a very, very desolate area. Considering the park is no longer in use anymore, there's no one coming to that area. This used to be a place where all types of people came, locals and people from all over various parts of Louisiana. But as you can see, there is nothing out here. There are a few residential areas, but as you're getting into this exact location, the only thing we're seeing here is nature for miles, all the way around, swamps, lakes, forests, and this desolate, abandoned amusement park. So what was this car doing there? And how did someone end up deceased in the trunk? Detective Barrer arrives on the scene. He's one of the first people to take a look inside the vehicle and in the trunk to examine and investigate the circumstances surrounding this horrific crime. Upon opening the trunk, Detective Barrer does see a partially charred body of a white female with blonde hair. Now, remember I said this vehicle was not completely on fire? Well, that's a good thing. If there's one good thing in this terrible tragedy, because the vehicle was never up in flames, there was so much evidence left behind. This fire was started deliberately. It was apparent because in the attempt to burn the evidence, including human remains, lighter fluid bottles were still intact. This was an arson. Since whoever did this was unsuccessful, Detective Barrer was able to see how horrifying this murder truly was. And that makes it so much worse. Sometimes you have to guess what a perpetrator did. But in this case, Detective Barrer was able to see every single step. He had been doing this long enough to be able to piece this puzzle together pretty quickly. Not only did someone kill this woman, they tried to destroy her remains, and so their disgusting deeds would never be found out. Her body was burned, but not to a point that she was unrecognizable. Tattoos were still visible on her body. The crime scene investigators could see that she had a tattoo on her arm and another one that was on her hip. One of the officers noticed there was a driver's license located in the side of the driver's side door. They retrieve it from that location and they're able to visually and preliminarily identify the body in the back of the trunk. 
as that of 31-year-old Lindsay Nichols. The first thought that Detective Breer had was, what is she doing here? Why this location? What brought her here? You could tell she was dressed in a little black dress, something that you would wear out to a nightclub, and nothing like that was nearby in this location. So how did Lindsay end up in this situation? Detective Barrere is a father. He just had to say goodbye to his children before he left to come on the scene that Father's Day. I say this every time, but it does not get easier. They see homicides in Louisiana day in and day out, especially in this area, but the circumstances surrounding Lindsay's murder were very horrifying. It was one of the worst scenes that he had seen in his career up until this point. And that is obviously why we're talking about this case today. Lindsay was in somewhat of a fetal position with burn marks to her body, but they could see that she had also been shot. As they moved some of the items, just set them aside, they were able to see a firearm in the trunk. It was also burned, but again, not to the point that it was unrecognizable. And this is what I mean when I say that they could see the steps that were taken because the evidence was not destroyed as they intended. Once photographs were taken of the scene, everything inside the vehicle, outside the vehicle, and all around the premises surrounding the vehicle, it's time to remove Lindsay's remains. Sometimes it's the first thing we wanna do because it's hard to see someone in that condition to know that this was their final resting place. It's so inhumane and devastating, but the procedures have to be followed now they can finally remove her. And when they did, they made an even more horrific discovery. It was obvious that she had been strangled and there were actually multiple gunshot wounds to her body. How does this beautiful, vibrant, loving, hardworking woman that's only 31 years old, who's out enjoying friends and having a homecoming of sorts, come face to face with an absolute monster? That's exactly what detectives want to know. And it's crucial that they find out as much as they can as fast as they can. The first 24 to 48 hours are crucial when you're dealing with a homicide investigation. They've already preliminarily identified her with not only her driver's license, but they also went ahead and ran her license plate. The number came back to Lindsay Nichols. They also retrieve an identification lanyard that she would wear around her neck when she was working. And there was a photograph of Lindsay and her son Peter on it. And this part was heartbreaking to me. One of the investigators pulled that item from inside the vehicle and he took note of what it said. On the back, it emphasizes safety and it says why I swore for safety. So why I choose to be safe. And it's a picture of her and her son. It just humanizes the entire situation because you realize that this person had a family this person has a son and she's not coming back to him. One thing that the death investigation technicians were able to ascertain was that her body was in full rigor mortis. It was very stiff. So they estimated that she was killed sometime between midnight and 5 a.m. But at this point, she's transferred to the morgue for a full autopsy. When Lindsay is removed from the trunk, the investigators are able to get inside and collect evidence left behind. They notice there are bullets inside the trunk, leading them to believe that she was shot while she was lying in the back of this vehicle. Then the gun was thrown inside and everything was lit on fire. The handgun used was a Taurus 9mm. You do not have to necessarily be trained in arson to ascertain that an accelerant was used. There is a pattern to the way that something burns and you can tell that something was thrown on top, drizzled, doused, not to mention the fact that they did recover the actual lighter fluid containers. They were bright yellow in color. I'm going to show you one up on the screen. It looks as though accelerant was thrown inside the trunk, on top of Lindsay, and on other areas of the trunk as well as outside the vehicle and inside on the dashboard. And that all of those areas were then set on fire. It doesn't seem like this person has experienced burning a vehicle. It's not a normal skill that we learn in practice. It's actually very difficult to burn a vehicle and also burn a human body, at least not hot enough to demolish them completely. The accelerant was called Ronsonol. 
It's a standard lighter fluid, but it's the one that comes in a smaller bottle and it looks like it's intended to refill something like a Zippo lighter. It's not a big gas can. So either this individual had this on hand, maybe they're a smoker, or Detective Barrera thought they could have picked it up somewhere like a gas station or a convenience store. So the first thing he thinks of is that they should go to nearby stores that would have been open in the middle of the night. If they sell this type of lighter fluid, maybe they can get a lead. There was something significant recovered from the attempted arson, a plastic bag inside the vehicle. It was burned on the outside, but the contents inside were still intact. That bag contained what appeared to be men's clothing. And they wanted so badly to just rip through that bag and find out exactly what's inside this car, but it had to be towed back to the police headquarters for a more extensive advanced crime scene investigation and they needed a search warrant first. Another thing Detective Barrere takes note of is that this seems like a very personal crime. The fact that someone is strangled, put into a vehicle, their own vehicle, driven somewhere and set on fire, it's a lot. But this really leads him to where a lot of investigations start anyway, and that's with whoever was with the victim last or the people close to the victim, a boyfriend, someone that she might have been seeing, somebody that could have been upset with her. They need to know everything and anything they can find about Lindsay herself and what she was doing. The first thing, of course, they have to notify her family. Now we're back in the original timeline. When I told you that Lindsay's mother, Jolene, was notified by the person that she sold her previous residence to, that the police were there looking for the parents of Lindsay Nichols. Jolene called around until she got a hold of the department that was responsible for handling Lindsay's case. Once she was giving the information, her only choice was to come down to the morgue the following day to identify her daughter. It's absolutely gut-wrenching to know as a parent that there's nothing you can do. You can't protect your child, you can't say goodbye, and you're left with so many questions. And in this case, you're left with a grandson who doesn't have a mother. And the word was traveling fast, especially through their small town. One of Jessica and Lindsay's mutual friends called up Jessica and told her to turn on the news because there was a vehicle found on the side of the road that looked like Lindsay's. And it had a body deceased in the trunk. As soon as Jessica went ahead and turned on the news, she just got this overwhelming, terrible, intense gut feeling and just broke down. So many thoughts were going through her head because at that moment, you don't know if this is your friend. I could imagine thinking, if this was my friend, am I responsible in some way? Did I do something wrong? Did I make a bad choice of like leaving her there that night? And at this point, we don't even know what happened. We don't even know if Lindsay had spoken to anyone after she left Passions because it was the only thing that her friends and family could do. They go and visit the morgue. They were there to support one another and within 24 hours of her body being found, she was positively identified as Lindsay Marie Nichols. But that's not the hardest part. Jolene had to explain to Peter why his mom wasn't coming home. Peter was nine years old Jolene doesn't have experience letting a child know that their mom has been killed. It's not something you can plan for. It's not something you practice. And she didn't know how to break the news as she was trying to explain it to say, your mommy's been shot. She's been killed. Peter didn't think she was serious because how can a child's mind understand what's going on? I mean, adults have a hard time processing this and it's all happening so fast. So let alone a child's mind that's not even developed yet. I had to listen to Jolene explain this part and it had me in tears. Because when they tried to tell Peter, he just kept thinking that they were teasing him, that they were just being funny. It's not something that you would be funny about. But again, in a child's mind, he just thought they were being silly. But when he finally realized that they were telling him the truth, that this is what really happened to his mom, of course Peter couldn't handle it. There was just so much crying, so much heartbreak. It's going to change that child's life forever. And I've heard this 
in other stories that I've done where family members, they don't get the chance to see their loved one. They don't get to see the body and say goodbye. So there isn't this closure. Although they've been told your loved one is is deceased, they're gone. There's no way for them to close that chapter because they just can't put their hands on them and say goodbye and see it for themselves. And there's just this lingering feeling like, is this really true? Clearly it is in these cases, but I can understand that disconnect of not having that proof, not having that moment where your brain can really wrap around what's going on. And one of the biggest questions in everyone's mind is who could have done this to Lindsay? Her mom has no clue. She didn't know where she was that night or who she was with. Plus, she couldn't think of anyone who would want to do something so horrific to her daughter. And they didn't even know the extent of what happened in this moment because the autopsy wasn't completed. A lot of times we assume that these investigations move fast, but they don't. And what I mean by that is that people just come forward immediately, that friends and family just come right in to talk to police. That's actually not how it usually happens. Detective Barrer has to track down the most credible witnesses, not just anyone and everyone that knew the victim. And by this time, it's getting later into the evening. By the time everything was processed and brought back to the station, so Detective Barrer says, you know what, I think we should start with the lighter fluid because he had that hunch that it could have been purchased nearby. If so, they can pull security footage, which would give them a visual on the suspect rather than wait to understand exactly what happened and who Lindsay was with. It's almost their best witness, a camera. You don't have to worry that the camera is lying or it didn't remember correctly. It's right there in front of you. So he sets out going store by store to ask if this particular lighter fluid was purchased in the last day or so. He's also narrowing it down to a store that would be open 24 hours because in his mind, this was something spur of the moment. It wasn't planned, especially with how haphazardly that everything was carried out. It was something he thought the perpetrator did in the moment and either they thought of it right after committing the crime or while they were in the commission of this crime. Because of the rigor mortis, he had a preliminary timeline. He went to a number of these stores and either they didn't sell that brand of lighter fluid or they hadn't sold it to anyone in the last couple days. There's also a possibility that this person that committed this crime drove from a far distance to get rid of Lindsay's vehicle, which could mean the convenience store that he's looking for could be way far from this area. And he doesn't have a lot of time. It's much more important for him to go back to the station and do things he can do from there. One of those things is looking through social media because these days with modern crimes that are happening within the last 10 years or so, we have social media. We have that social media footprint so we can go and backtrack. Maybe Lindsay posted something. There's Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, So that is the next plan of action. Another thing they can get from social media is potential witnesses, friends, people that can provide them with more information in an interview style sit down meeting the next morning. And I feel like investigators do not sleep. It seems like they are always doing something, even at home. Not that they want to bring their work home, but going through social media, that's something all of us can do right here, right now. We can be armchair detectives. A lot of crimes have been solved recently because of social media like Gabby Petito comes to mind. With the internet just coming together and being able to look for clues from all over the country, if not the world, especially when you're invested in a crime. And a person like Detective Barrer, this is their job. They're invested and they're going to spend hours and hours scouring the internet for clues. I wouldn't say that Lindsay had a big social media presence, but because she was interested in modeling, She did have a lot of photos on her Facebook page and her Facebook is still up. It's in the in remembrance mode, but there's a lot of beautiful photos of Lindsay. There were also a couple of posts within the last few weeks and even the last day before the crime happened and they were suspicious or at least of interest to detectives. I went ahead and collected these so that we could see them up on the screen. This one is from June 8th, 2015 and it said, Some shit just makes my nerves bad as fuck. So glad I moved and certain people don't know where I live anymore, just saying. This was only a few weeks before Lindsay ended up dead. What did it mean? 
that she had something getting on her nerves, that she was nervous about something, was she upset, and she's glad that she moved. Was there someone following her, stalking her? And she says certain people. So who are these certain people or person? Could they have followed her from Texas back to Louisiana? And she says she's glad they don't know where she lives anymore. But do they know where she goes out? Do they know the people that she hangs out with? Are they jealous? Do they have ill will toward her? And she's posting this publicly. So did they see this post? These are the questions detectives have to ask. And it's why it's good that social media exists sometimes. It is a double-edged sword. There's also a photo that was taken right before this post. It's from the same day. It looks like Lindsay was visiting a bar or a restaurant. You can see TVs in the background. It looks like sort of a bar and grill, like a sports bar. There were 19 comments on this particular photo. So investigators have to go through them. However, there wasn't anything suspicious when they go through those. They move on to another post. That was on June 19th, 2015. This was just a day before she went out with her friends. It says, I've learned something so beautiful from a really messed up situation. So bittersweet and so enlightening. Where do I go from here? And then there's an emoji of a pen. That's a lot to decipher. I don't know Lindsay, I'm not a detective. It's not my job to sift through, understand and analyze things like this, but it's clear because it's in her own words that she was in a really messed up situation. Although she is saying she learned from it and it's bittersweet and enlightening. But the question is, did it involve someone else? Do they see it as enlightening and bittersweet? And there's a pen at the end of her comment as though she is not done writing her story. However, somebody did close that chapter for her. She didn't know where she was going from there, but we know where she ended up. These Facebook posts were not giving them any leads, but it didn't take long before both Jessica and Melanie, who were with Lindsay the night before, came forward. They come down to the homicide department to be interviewed. It's tough. Having to recount the moments that you spent with your loved one, who is no longer here, but it is so important to provide any and all information you can before you forget everything, everything you know up until the last point that you saw them. It's imperative in order to catch who did this. And Jessica knows this. She's more than willing to help. She comes in armed with her phone, going hour by hour, letting detectives know step by step what the girls did that night. I already relayed a lot of that information to you. They were at Gabby's until about one o'clock. Then they headed over to Spice Bar and Grill. Melanie came there to meet them around 1.30 or 1.45. Jessica tells detectives that she wanted to leave. She was tired and uncomfortable, and she tells them about Bam, that Bam met them at Spice, and while they were still there, Lindsay, Bam, and Melanie took a photo together, which she provided to them, and Detective Barrere printed it out. Barrere took note that Bam was a black male around six feet tall and probably 200 pounds. He definitely needs more information about this man, including his real name. So he presses Jessica about whether Lindsay had any violent relationships in the past, boyfriends, and Jessica almost instantly, before he's even done asking the question, butts in and insists, a boyfriend did not do this to Lindsay. She says, this is not going to be a boyfriend that did this. And she adds that sometimes when Lindsay gets drunk, she becomes overly friendly. Now, Barrer needs to speak with Melanie, and Melanie's waiting in another interview room for him to arrive. He needs the timeline to be picked up from where Jessica left off. So Melanie tells Barrer she doesn't think they got to Passions until around three o'clock in the morning. She explains that Lindsay drove Bam to Passions and that she followed them in her own car. Barrer wants to know more about Bam but Melanie says she doesn't know him, but she does think that Bam must know something because he was the person that Lindsay left passions with. And then she plays an audio recording of a phone call between her and Lindsay, which by the way, I was confused about. How does she record a call? This had me so mind fucked. Maybe I'm thinking too hard because I can actually hear it ring in the beginning. And then I hear Lindsay pick up and Melanie's asking her, you know, where are you? But how does she have this record? Let me know in the comments. How is she recording this? 
I just had to let that part go because I didn't understand how she would be able to do it. I know you can pull up voice messages and all of that, but an actual phone call? In any case, you can hear Lindsay in her own words telling Melanie that she's GPSing back to Bam's car. This was after Lindsay and Bam decided to leave. Melanie asks her, where are you going after this? She tells her she's going to hang out with her people from the east. She's referring to New Orleans east side. Listening to that call, Melanie breaks down because Melanie had said, call me if you need me. And then you just hear Lindsay's laugh. And that hurts because she did need someone. She may not have thought she would, but she needed someone. She probably felt like she had everything under control in any situation, especially because of this next bit of information that Melanie provides. Lindsay had a gun. Melanie explains that if Lindsay felt safe with you, she would leave the gun in her center console. But if she didn't feel safe, she would keep the gun in the side door of her car and keep her arm down near it. Barrera then asked if Lindsay was with anyone else that night at Passions. And she explains that Lindsay must have known a number of people there because she was having all kinds of conversations, very friendly conversations, hanging out with both dancers and people at the bar. Melanie said that Lindsay must have known this one guy really well because she jumped into his arms when she saw him. But Melanie has no idea who any of these people are. From the information that Jessica and Melanie provided Barrere, he's narrowed down the timeline to a three to four hour period that's unaccounted for. From about 4 a.m. until the first call came into police about someone seeing Lindsay's black Honda Accord on the side of the road. So at this point, the biggest lead that they have in this case is that Lindsay left with a man named Bam. They know what he looks like from the photo that Jessica has shared with them. They're able to put his name into the system and they somehow get information about where Bam lives. So they decide they're going to pay him a visit. Right now, everything is pointing to Bam. Either he had something to do with it or he knows something. There was not a lot of time that passed between the time that they left Passions together and when that car was found on the side of the road. So what happened? The theory at this point is that either Bam wanted to cause Lindsay harm, so they leave together and something transpires between the time they leave and the time they get to Bam's vehicle, or that she brings him back to Spice to get his vehicle, drops him off, and then goes somewhere else, or that someone saw her when she's dropping him off, and that other person causes her harm and leaves her on the side of the road. Another thing that was significant at this point was the gun. Detective Barrere believes that Lindsay was possibly shot with her own firearm. The next day, a candlelight vigil is held in Lindsay's memory. Detective Barrere attends, not just because he wants to ask questions, because he does, but he wants to see who comes to the vigil. There could be some very important information gleaned from the fact that certain people show up or certain people don't show up. He can size people up, see if they're acting differently, see if he can find any leads. But he's also there because he cares. Lindsay is not just a number, she is a person. And he shows his respect for her family, for the people that she's left behind. All of Lindsay's friends and family are gathered around. They're wearing shirts with her on it and they're lighting candles and those like pink solo cups. And Jessica spoke and she said that Lindsay's son will never have a mother and that she can't imagine someone having to tell her kids something like that that she would never be coming back and that Lindsay was the best person. Jessica just prays that she gets justice because no one deserved to die like that. And that's when they let off all the balloons. And this was the second night after Lindsay had been found. Right after the vigil's over, Detective Brer doesn't hesitate. He makes a trip over to Bams. He knocks on the door and just asks, are you friends with Lindsay Nichols? And he says, yes. Bam actually tells detectives to come inside. The first thing that detectives notice is that Bam is a big man. He's a very big man. Once they get to talking to him preliminarily, they realize they really want to sit down for a formal interview. So they ask Bam if he wouldn't mind coming down to the homicide department. He agrees, but he says he's gotta come the next day. And the thing is, you don't know if he's ever going to show up. You're hoping he does, because they're at a loss for more information. 
He was the last person that anyone knows that saw Lindsay alive. Luckily, Bam is true to his word. He does show up at the homicide department the very next day. The thing that detectives want to know is how does he know Lindsay, how long has he known her, and who is she to you? And Bam explains, she's a good friend and that they've known each other for a little over a year and a half. They want to know, how did you end up with Lindsay on Saturday night? I know you're probably aware of this because you're watching a true crime video. I don't know anyone that watches true crime that doesn't know, especially when it's dealing with violent crimes or homicides, that you're always being recorded. If you are speaking to a detective or an officer in the police station, you are being recorded. So while Bam is speaking with Detective Barrere and his partner, he's also being recorded and there are other detectives that are watching in other rooms. And they're looking for everything, for body language patterns, the tone of his voice, They're also able to look up information while Bam is speaking. This is helpful in investigations because they can't waste any time. So while one detective is in there gathering the information, the other detectives can be looking into those details in the case. You will also notice that detectives will leave periodically and then come back. That's for a lot of reasons. Some of it is tactic, but they're also checking in with other investigators. Sometimes additional information can help get a confession from someone that's being interviewed. The more information that you're armed with, the better. And Bam is about to fill in a lot of those blanks. He said that Lindsay texted him around 2 a.m. saying that she was at Spice. He said, okay, cool. He's gonna come up and meet her there and hang out for a little while. When he gets there, Lindsay says, you know what, it's Father's Day. Let me buy you a drink. I'll treat you. Let's go to Passions. Let's just have some fun. Then Bam says, as soon as they walk into that club, she starts talking to a group of guys. They were, as he put it, young men, young guys. He couldn't hear the conversation because the music was way too loud, but he could tell it was friendly. This was a friendly conversation. She seemed to know these people. After they've been there for a while, Lindsay does tell Bam that she's going to go and she's going to drop him off. He's like, okay, cool. Sounds good. They leave together. She drops him off at his truck. According to him, they're back at the parking lot at Spice at this time. That's where his truck was. Detective Barrere asks him, where was Lindsay going? He says, I do not specifically know where she was going, but she said she was going to be hanging out with some friends. Bam gets back into his truck and he looks back and he sees Lindsay pulling off the road and driving toward New Orleans East. That area of town matches up to what Melanie said because on the audio recording of the conversation with Lindsay, Lindsay says that she's meeting up with her people in the East. At this point, Detective Barrere doesn't hold back. He's like, listen, Bam, if you know who did this or you're responsible in any way, we hope you'll say it now instead of us having to figure it out later. And he says, Did you kill Lindsay Nichols? Bam's like, no, sir. He says, I promise you, sir. I promise you. If I knew anything, I would tell you. He he really sounded genuine. I listened to this interview, and to me, he seemed calm, well-spoken, and genuinely concerned about his friend. He said he couldn't see anyone having a problem with Lindsay. She was a good-hearted person. And he is breaking down a little bit and saying that he's hurting because he knows that Lindsay is gone. It's frustrating because we are at day three in the investigation and they are no closer to figuring out what happened. However, this is the process. You have to eliminate people one by one. They decide they're going to pull some surveillance video from Passions Nightclub to see if there's anything significant on that video. They're also in the process of getting that search warrant to search the inside of Lindsay's vehicle and have an advanced crime scene team analyze everything within that car. They're hoping that they're going to find a bigger lead from that evidence. They were able to look inside and see things that they thought would be significant, but they weren't allowed to touch anything in that moment because they had to go through the entire legal process. However, there are things that could be collected. So the very next day, they go down to the headquarters where the car is locked up. They bring out their crime scene photographer to take pictures of everything as they're sifting through it. And many people have a lot of things in their trunk, a lot of things in their vehicles, you name it, everyday things, clothing, accessories, shoes, and Lindsay was no different. So it's hard to differentiate between something that might be 
evidence and something of value and just everyday items that were thrown inside this vehicle. However, I did tell you about a plastic bag that was burned on the outside, but the contents looked as though they were in completely intact. From what they could tell, it looked like men's clothing, and that was significant. The crime scene technicians, they come out, they collect swabs from places like the steering wheel in case anyone else drove the car, there could be DNA on it, to put it in its final resting place. The trunk was swabbed inside the vehicle on the dashboard, any other place where DNA or fingerprints could be found. But probably the biggest find during the search of her car was her cell phone and the men's clothing. There was a white tank top, you know, like the wife beater looking like white tank top that men usually wear with basketball shorts and a pair of red basketball shorts and a pair of socks. The tank top looked like it had blood on it and you could clearly see there were red blood stains on the socks. These items were put inside of this plastic bag with the intention that it would be burned with no evidence left behind. The most likely scenario is that the killer was wearing this outfit. And when he was done committing the crime, he undressed, threw his clothes inside, doused the entire vehicle, including the trunk and Lindsay with lighter fluid, hoping that the entire car would burn to ashes. Even though these are some significant finds, the DNA analysis takes weeks. So right now, detectives have to do what they can to generate more leads while they are waiting. They go back to the station and they look through the surveillance footage from Passions. I have some still shots from the footage that I wanna show you. You can see Melanie, Bam, and Lindsay, they're entering the club. This is Bam in the blue shirt. This is Lindsay in the black dress, and this is Melanie. There's also footage of Bam and Lindsay leaving the club together, just like Melanie and Bam had said. Right next to the club, is a Shell gas station, it's right here. Bam and Lindsay went there to get some cash out of the ATM before going to Bam's truck. While looking through this footage, detectives are trying to see if there's anything that contradicts the story that Bam gave or anything suspicious. Like, was he waiting for her to take money out? Was he threatening her for the cash? That's not the case. Nothing's out of the ordinary, just two friends hanging out, getting money out of an ATM. Detectives do not see a motive here when it comes to Bam. So he is pretty much eliminated at this point. They have to wait two whole weeks and nothing's happening in the case. They had no new leads and it's pretty much a dead end. However, they are about to get some shocking information and it comes from Lindsay's phone records. Detective Breer is going through Lindsay's call log, incoming and outgoing, and he could not believe what he saw. At 4.45 a.m., Lindsay made a call to 911. This is unbelievable. You're expecting to see a lot of things when you're looking through these phone records, but you are not expecting a victim to have called the police and not been helped. He is so confused. He has to understand more about what happened during this phone call. So they know they're going to have to contact the police department and find out what was on that 911 recording. They also pinpoint the last person that Lindsay called that night before in the 911 call. There was a number that she called a couple times. So they go ahead and they run it through their system and it comes up to a man named Theon Samson. When they checked where he lived, he was from the East. So you recall on that phone call, Lindsay said she's gonna go hang out with her people from the East. Who is Theon Samson? Where was he that night? Did he see her that night? Does he have anything to do with the crime? They run his name and they're able to find out this man had convictions for aggravated battery as well as illegally carrying weapons. They also pull some photos of him and they submit a search warrant so they can pull his phone records. Meanwhile, they go down to the police department where the 911 call center is and they request to listen to that recording. Get this. When they go over there and they pull these records, one of the custodians that was helping them actually showed them that Lindsay provided her full name to the 911 operator. You know, I did a case like this. It was so heartbreaking. It's one of the most heartbreaking cases on my channel. I will link it below in the description box, up in the cards at the end of this video. This case is so familiar because both of these victims actually tried to call for help. And I'll tell you right now, you're going to hear the 911 call, not in its entirety, 
but I'll play a portion for you, and I'm sure you will agree that you wish things would have been different. Lindsay tells the 911 dispatcher that she's hiding from two men in her car, that she had to run away and hide from them because they were trying to get her to perform a sexual act that she was not comfortable with. She didn't want to do that with these men. And after refusing their sexual advances, she runs, she hides. They find her in her vehicle and that's when she's on the phone with 911 and she tells them, I'm going to have to shoot them. At this point, she has her gun and she is in her car. All the while, there are no officers coming out. Instead, the 911 operator is listening to this crime unfold. You can hear these men wrestling the gun away from Lindsay. It's two against one and they get her gun. After that, there are some very nasty words that are spewed out of these men's mouths towards Lindsay. Very dehumanizing disgusting, derogatory, just vulgar statements made toward this woman. And then there is just this extended period of time where you can just hear this poor woman struggling to save her own life. After that, the call is dropped. Detective Barrera said this is the worst 911 call he has ever heard in his entire career. This woman died. An operator stayed on to listen to this entire conversation, but there was no one there to help her. These two men had gotten a hold of her keys and her gun, and they were threatening to kill her. And not only that, this phone call captures the moments that these men were attacking her. During this call, she also told the operator that she might have to shoot them, that that was her only choice, but apparently she never got the chance. You can hear the operator. They're asking her, you know, what does the person look like? And they're trying to calm Lindsay down, but she's just crying. And she keeps saying, hurry up, hurry up, please hurry up. You can also hear Lindsay pleading with the perpetrators, telling them, please, please just put down the gun and give me back my keys. But the saddest thing is that Lindsay is just telling the operator she needs help. Please send someone, please send someone. I need help. Please send someone. Hurry. She's saying this over and over again for eight desperate minutes. I can't even fathom being on an eight-minute phone call and not having someone come to my rescue. At the end of this call, the operator is saying nothing. They're just listening to the sound of Lindsay crying and moaning and being repeatedly struck. It's horrifying. We think, or at least I do, that when we call 911, we're going to get saved. We always think that's the most important thing to do. Like if we can get to our phones, we're safe. We feel like if we hit those three numbers and we call, we're going to be okay. But Lindsay was not okay. This is not okay. This operator failed Lindsay Nichols. They did not relay this information to the appropriate and proper departments. It was categorized as a low level response needed, low level. This wasn't even a high priority. So by the time the units arrived, Lindsay and her murderers were gone. It was too late. It is absolutely gut-wrenching to know. Because sometimes we don't know. We have to imagine or to guess what someone's last moments were, but to hear them, it puts it on a different level of sadness. And for Jolene, having to hear her daughter in those last moments and knowing how brutal they were, is something that haunts her and it always will. Because sometimes when things happen, we can imagine that they went differently, but you can't escape the truth. In this case, you know. There is a commander from the police department that admits when they make mistakes, people can die. This is a life or death job. You're dealing with emergencies and you have to take it seriously. Not to say we know exactly what was going on in that dispatcher's mind. We're human. I understand that, but I don't understand how something like this can happen. It's been four weeks at this time and had that connection been made between this call and Lindsay's murder sooner, 
then things would have progressed a lot more quickly. But they do get 40,000 911 calls a month. So that correlation just wasn't made. And unfortunately, because they did have to hear Lindsay say what she did, they got a picture of where she was, where this was happening. Because she told the dispatcher that she was near a car dealership. She even described there were more than one man. And it seemed like she knew one of them, but she was afraid to tell the dispatcher who. She said it was a guy that she had met once before. Detectives are going to use all of this as evidence and sift through it and see if they can make any more connections. And meanwhile, the autopsy report came back. In October, Cynthia Gardner concluded that Lindsay suffered nine gunshot wounds, one to the head, six to the neck, and one to the hand. There was evidence that Lindsay had been strangled and suffered blunt force injury. The burning to Lindsay's body occurred post-mortem. A toxicology report was conducted as well, and it indicated that there was alcohol in Lindsay's bloodstream. Dr. Gardner estimated that the muzzle of the gun was approximately two feet away when it was fired, and it was from a nine millimeter firearm. The shell casings and the bullets that were recovered from the passenger area and the trunk area were tested and it was proved that the weapon they came from was Lindsay's nine millimeter handgun. The investigation further revealed Lindsay was shot while in the passenger side of the vehicle, as well as when she was moved to the trunk area. It is absolutely terrifying to be in such close quarters, trapped in your vehicle and killed with your own firearm. The biggest lead that Detective Barrer has right now is this guy, Theon Sampson. Lindsay called him right before the hour of her murder, and it's about to get intense because they get a hold of Theon Sampson's phone records, modern technology. It's absolutely amazing what we can do now compared to what we could even do a decade or two ago. We can actually pinpoint where someone was, and it's all because of something we never want to put down, our phones. That's the one thing that people who do wrong do wrong, keeping their phones on them because they are the most trustworthy witnesses of all. You can't deny where you were. If GPS is putting you there, you were there. It turns out they were able to pinpoint exactly where that 911 call came from according to Lindsay's phone records and GPS coordinates. Lo and behold, Theon Sampson's phone pings to the very same location at the same time. So while she's on this 911 call, this man is in the same place. It's pretty obvious. But you know how it goes in criminal investigations? You have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. You don't want to make a mistake. You have to find multiple ways to make sure you can place your perpetrator in that location. But as far as detectives are concerned, they have their man, or at least one of them. Because we know from Lindsay's phone call, there were two men involved in this crime. They definitely want to dig in. They want to gather as much information about Theon Sampson as they possibly can. So where do they go first? They go to social media and they find his Facebook page and they find some very peculiar photos. He's almost dressed up in costumes all the time and they find out that Theon Sampson is actually a stripper. He has an alias, Bonafide. They just call him Bone. Yep. He travels to different strip clubs and he does ladies nights there and dances. He's pretty well known in the community. You could even say he's kind of a local celebrity. He's very good looking, big white smile, nice physique, tattoos, but ladies and, and gentlemen, we know the looks can be deceiving, but he's definitely trying to get the ladies to do whatever he wants. He also has a criminal record, which we spoke about. Detectives have seen enough. Literally, looking at these pictures are burning their eyes. They decide the next thing they need to do is call him and they have his phone number. So they go ahead and give him a call. But here's the thing, they don't wanna tip him off. This is crucial because they want him to feel comfortable talking. If they let him know that he's a suspect at this point, he might clam up, he might not answer, he might get away. So they have to be buddy buddy. They have to act like, oh, they're just covering all their bases, reaching out to everyone who might have known Lindsay very casual. They just want to know, like, what can you tell us about that night? That kind of thing. Detective Barrera does a fabulous job being nonchalant, very calm, just like, hey, 
we heard that you might have seen our victim out and about the other night. Would you mind coming in and just come in and talk to us for 10, 15 minutes? We're interviewing everyone. No big deal. Just want to know if you bumped into her that night. It works. Theon agrees to come down to the NOPD. He says, yeah, I'll let you know what I know about Lindsay. And he is just calm and cool and collected on the phone. He doesn't even sound like he's worried at all. He just says, okay, cool, I'll come in. But what he doesn't realize is he just added one more piece of concrete evidence to their case against him. And that's the fact he answered the phone. By simply answering that phone, he confirmed that that is his phone. That's the number that pinged where Lindsay made that 911 call. And now it's connected to him. Now, I can't play you this entire interview, but I will just say this. I didn't like this interview. I didn't like the way he acted. He was smug. He knew right away who they were questioning him about. And he says, I don't know her last name, but her first name, Lindsay. They asked, do you know what happened to her? And he literally says, yeah, she burned. That bothered me because, yeah, you thought that she was going to be burned. You thought you were going to get away with this. It just bothered me he would say it that way instead of she died or she was murdered. He says she was burned. When questioned about how Lindsay knew Theon, he said that she would come in and watch him dance at places that he went for ladies' nights. He says, yeah, I'm an exotic dancer. And then this is just something that made my skin crawl. It's these kind of statements I do not like. I don't even know if you could call it bragging, but I've seen it in other cases with different perpetrators, just the way that they carry themselves. But he says, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really pay great. However, you get more cat than anything. Cat. I think you know what he means. Pussy. Wow. Okay. We know you're good looking. You've got a great physique, you're an exotic dancer, living the life, but you're the suspect in taking someone's life. So be serious, but he's not. And this <laughs> was just shocking. Just wait, just wait. Because you're gonna hear me tell you something that he did in this interview that was disgusting. Just wait. Detective Barrer has been doing this for 15 years at this point, he's seen it all. But you just wait. Because even he was caught off guard they asked Theon how he ended up running into Lindsay that night, and he says, I saw her at Passions. This time, he's not dancing. He's actually hanging out and drinking, which might have been a little bit different because usually he is on stage when Lindsay sees him, and she recognized him. So when she came in, as soon as they locked eyes, she ran up to him and gave him a hug, and for the rest of the night, he said that he was flirting with her. He admits he was flirting, and he wanted to see what was up with her, what she wanted to do. That was his intention. He says that she told him she would call him later. All the while, he is totally calm while he's saying this. It's like he's explaining what he ate that day. He's able to look the detectives right in the face and say that is the last time I saw her. So that put them together around four o'clock in the morning while they're still at the club. Well, they know that Lindsay called him after four, so they asked him, did she ever call you? He said, yeah, she called me. I don't know what time it was though because I didn't answer. They said, well, where were you? And he says, I was at home. They said, did you go anywhere else that night? He says, no, sir. Now he does something tricky here. He asks Theon, did you have your phone on all night? Or And he doesn't hesitate. He's like, yeah, I had my phone all night. I always have my phone. He said, no one else had your phone? He goes, no. Now, what he doesn't understand is that he's confirming that no one else could have been where that 911 call was made because he was with his phone. Detective Barrer does another little buddy-buddy thing and he says, you know, everybody I've been interviewing today, they've been giving me DNA samples, so Theon agrees to do it as well. But here's the crazy part of the interview, at least in my perspective. <sighs> when Detective Barrer goes to leave the room to get the DNA kit, so he can take this monster's DNA, this narcissistic fool, is so conceited and smug, he asks if he can take a selfie. A f Are you serious? He's like, hey, uh, can I take a picture in here? Literally taking a selfie in the interview room. This cannot be real. 
all the while other detectives can see everything that's going on in the room and they're just looking at him like he's a specimen under a microscope because it's so peculiar to see someone just taking selfies smiling shamelessly thinking that this is funny that it's a joke this is someone's life and you're suspected to be involved in taking that life i don't think he ever thought he was going to get caught getting that dna sample was huge because they wanted to compare that DNA found on the men's clothing. Remember the tank top and the basketball shorts? They really want to get a match because as soon as they know that it's a match, which they suspect it is, they can arrest this man. Meanwhile, the detectives want to ask Lindsay's friends if they know anything about Theon, and Jessica says yes. They met him three months ago while they were out on a girls' night. They were at a place called the Tiki Hut, That's where they ran into Theon for the first time. Here's the thing. Him and Lindsay, they had chemistry right away. They're both really good looking people. They're outgoing, like I said before, their energies matched. That was the guy I was referring to that came into Passions. The one she ran up to, gave him a big hug. He picks her up off the ground. They had the same outgoing personalities. They got along really well. So how do things go so wrong? Because that night, everything seemed to be going right they exchanged numbers they were hanging out together and they exchanged texts here and there over the next few months there's something else about theon he was used to getting what he wanted all the cat he wants anytime he wants it he goes to ladies nights and i don't know if you've ever been to one of these performances but it's a very provocative there are women who are touching these men a lot of them let you do it They're up on that stage and they're getting anything they want. And it seems like he really wanted Lindsay. Further information provided shows that Theon's apartment is located on the same road as the Chevrolet dealership. It's right here, right nearby. And that is where the initial 911 call came from. This is not too far away from Passions. Look at this. It's a two minute drive. This Chevrolet dealership, it's only five minutes away from Theon's apartment. This could have been a place where Lindsay was used to parking when she comes to Passions because this parking lot right here, it's right across the street. Here's the Shell station and right next to the Shell is Passions. It makes sense. She might have parked there and that's why her vehicle was there. I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. Almost a month had gone by at this point and detectives are eager to put the people responsible for Lindsay's murder behind bars. Her friends are terrified. They can't carry on their normal everyday activities because they don't know who did this. They are close to Lindsay. What if they're next? What if someone is just waiting for them? What if someone thinks that they know something, that they've been a witness? It's a scary time. A lot of times we don't think about the people who are left behind who are waiting for someone to be arrested for this so that they're not thinking this murderer could be right around the corner watching them. And that is exactly why social media can be so helpful. So Theon actually gives his DNA to detectives. And while they're waiting, they decide to take a peek at his Instagram. And when they do, they can't believe what they find. It's laughable. And I don't mean that it's funny. It's just kind of crazy because you would think If you just committed a brutal crime and you knew what you were wearing while committing that crime, you might want to delete the pictures of you wearing it a week before. Not Theon, because there he is. Do you see this picture right here? This is him wearing the same tank top and basketball shorts. The exact same basketball shorts. The and one red basketball shorts. You can't miss it. They're the same. Detectives are actually blown away. This is a 30-year-old man. He doesn't have the wherewithal to understand the magnitude of him leaving this evidence in plain sight, but that's because I think he was so confident that she burned, which means his clothes would also be burned. Keep in mind, the media doesn't know or isn't releasing every detail of this crime. Theon probably thought Everything within that vehicle was completely burned. He might not realize how he's implicating himself over and over again without doing anything. 
Detectives are laughing when they see this, not because it's funny. It's laughable because this man is cocky enough, confident enough, or even naive enough to think that he's going to get away with this. They didn't have to guess for long about the shorts because the DNA results came back. It was a match. Theon was wearing those shorts. They have their man, one of their men. They still have to find perpetrator number two. But right now, they are on the hunt for Theon Sampson to put him in handcuffs and bring him to the police department. They actually track him down at a tattoo shop. They walk right in. They see his car outside. They walk in there and they arrest him. And he just looks surprised. He looks shocked. He's just sitting there getting a tattoo. And it's just crazy to me how this man can go on with his life after he just taking someone else's. Just go back to your normal everyday routine, getting tattooed, probably hooking up with girls, dancing. Like it didn't even matter. At this point, detectives are hoping Theon gets something else permanent, a jail sentence. They don't hesitate. They bring him into the station under arrest for the murder of Lindsay Nichols. This time, Theon is acting completely different. He's got his head down on the table. He's asking, why am I here? Why are you trying to pin this on me? Detective Barrera is like, because you did it? Because you did this murder? That's why. But he's keeping his cool. He's just telling him, listen, here's the thing. You couldn't have been home because we found your clothing on the front seat of her vehicle. And there could be a way for you to explain why they were there, but only you know that. And he keeps saying, no, I was at home. And they say, well, you could give us the name of the other guy. And he says, I wasn't with anyone. Then he says he's going to need an attorney. And he asked for one. So they couldn't get any more information. So get this. This is probably my favorite part about Detective Barrera being on this case and why I like him so much. Not only because he's a veteran detective and so good at his job, but he does his job in such a way that's so memorable because he hates criminals just as much as I do. When Theon is being arrested and put into lockup, they are putting his hands behind his back with the handcuffs. Officers are standing by his side. He's being taken away and locked up. And while this is happening, while he's in this vulnerable position, Detective Brewer's like, hey, buddy, you need to go one last selfie before you leave? I couldn't help it. It is funny to me because he's making him feel this small. And it's about time that an ego so big is made to feel as small as he really is. Because only a weak and disgusting person could carry out this type of crime. So the fact he was able to get that one last jab at him, it made me happy. Once her friends were informed about the arrest, it was sad. And to think that it had something to do with the fact that she wouldn't do something sexual in nature. But isn't that how a lot of these crimes occur? They don't know everything yet. The investigation's not over. But knowing how senseless this was and how this little boy is left without a mother, that these men just disregarded the fact that this is a person, regardless if she just doesn't want to do something with you. I just don't know how it could escalate to that point, but you're going to find out. When detectives go back through Theon's phone, there's another number he's communicating with around the same time on the night of the crime. They run that phone number and it's a match to a man named Troy Vernado. Now they have to look into this person, but before they do, they get an anonymous tip from Crime Stoppers. On the morning the vehicle was found, a tip was called in anonymously by someone who saw two men next to that Honda Accord. They gave a perfect description of Theon. They said he had a mohawk, tattoos, a nose ring, and they say they saw him at the trunk of her car. Then he gets into a Jaguar. Well, it turns out Troy owns a Jaguar. By the time Detective Barrer wants to bring Troy in for questioning, he already has a lawyer. Reason being, when Theon's attorneys found out that they were implicating Troy, they had their client give a statement, and you can probably guess what Theon said. He blamed everything on Troy. Troy was the one that did it. I didn't have anything to do with it. And then Troy's lawyers come back and say, no, he knows what happened. 
He knows everything that happened, but he wasn't involved. One of the most frustrating things when it comes to murder cases like this is getting to the truth. That's what the victim's families want to know at the end of the day, because nothing is going to bring back their loved one, but they want to know the truth. And they want the people that are responsible off the streets for good. With all the evidence and the eyewitness accounts and the Jaguar description and the description of the people who match both Troy and Theon's appearances, they were both indicted on second degree murder. And both of these men went to trial. The prosecution was able to theorize about what happened that night. So I want to tell you what they put together. They say that Lindsay drops Bam off at his truck. So she did leave Passions. She gets a call from Theon around 4.18 a.m. GPS has her at his apartment complex, so they must have agreed to meet up there. She arrives around 4.30 in the morning. At this point, Theon's text message records indicate he texts Troy and lets him know Lindsay arrived. Troy was actually waiting outside at this point. And Theon says, come up, and he tells him that the apartment door is unlocked. Theon is trying to arrange a threesome between Lindsay himself and Troy. This happened shortly before Lindsay runs out of the apartment barely dressed. So something happened when that man came into the apartment. And by interviewing some of Lindsay's friends, they suggest most likely she didn't know that man. She doesn't know Troy and she didn't agree to have him involved in any kind of sexual act. So she runs and these two men run after her. Of course, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. For one thing, they don't know how someone got a hold of her car keys. They don't know if they were dropped on the ground while she was running away or if they caught her and they grabbed her keys. But by 4.45 a.m., she makes that 911 call and GPS places her vehicle in that parking lot at the Chevrolet dealership. Lindsay was trying to hold the door shut and they had the keys. She couldn't hold on anymore and they got in and they attacked her. At some point, she was placed into the trunk of her vehicle after being manually strangled. At five o'clock in the morning, GPS puts her phone, Theon's phone, and Troy's phone all going in the same direction. Theon is driving her vehicle, followed by Troy in his Jaguar. They drive to several desolate areas, almost like they're trying to decide where to leave her. And they finally drive all the way out near the area near Six Flags. And that's where the vehicle was finally located. And she was shot the remainder of the times in the neck while in the trunk of her vehicle. They really don't know the exact sequence of events, but this is the most probable situation. Then they douse the car with lighter fluid and attempt to set it on fire. Theon jumps in Troy's vehicle and jets off. The trial commenced on September 17, 2018 three years after these men were arrested. And I followed a Facebook page. I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's called Justice for Lindsay Marie. And I went all the way back in time to when the crime first occurred. I saw all the information about how many times this trial was delayed for all kinds of things. A lot of times, just these two men playing with the legal system. Theon and Troy were charged with second degree murder, second degree kidnapping, obstruction of justice and Troy was charged with an additional crime of accessory after the fact. Both men entered a plea of not guilty. Theon decided he would plead guilty to manslaughter and he was given that plea deal and sentenced to 40 years in prison. They did try to get Troy to take a plea deal but he said no. He decided to go to trial and that wasn't a very good idea. He ended up getting life in prison for second degree murder, the kidnapping, and the obstruction of justice. Jolene definitely didn't hold back when Troy was on trial. She said that she hopes he burns in hell and that the 911 call haunts her every single day of her life and she hopes it haunts him too, but she doubts it will. Because this man would never admit that he did anything. In fact, and this really bothered me, I'm gonna end this in just a moment, but I have to tell you this, he said, I just want to say, this isn't justice for Lindsay. Justice would be getting the people who have done this. And he added, for what it's worth, I know what you're going through. Really? 
The reason he said this was because the mother of his own children died two years before this. But that's not what's happening here. And to have the audacity to minimize this situation makes me sick. Everyone was impacted by this. Jessica said that day changed her whole opinion of people in this world. And every single time I do a case, I think the same thing. Like always, I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here with me. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for giving your time to these victim stories and to me and my channel. I will see you in my next video. Bye.